So we're now finally moving into the weather forecasting. This is like the part where you guys are probably going to be like, oh, yeah, I kind of remember some of this stuff because I heard Hutch Johnson say it this morning on Valley News Live. Or, oh, I check my weather app um, before I get dressed in the morning to determine what I am going to wear for the day. This is the stuff that honestly affects you day in and day out. So hopefully you find it as interesting as I do. We are still working with Middle School Earth Science Standard 3-2, which states that you'll be able to explain how the motions and complex interactions of air masses result in changes in weather conditions. So basically what you're going to be able to do by the end of this is identify the different types of weather data, identify the different types of weather data collection tools, and then also explain the importance of each set of data collected. So why we care about um, collecting this specific type of data and using it in everyday life. So make sure that you have your notes out in front of you um, so that you are good to go. So relative humidity. Relative humidity you've been collecting for the last seven-ish weeks on and off. Um, and I know when I first explained it, I'm like, oh, I'll get to it. Well, here's me finally getting to it. So relative humidity is comparing the amount of water vapor in the air with the maximum amount of water that the air can actually hold at that temperature. Um, this is collected using the data points of percentages. So when I look at my um, weather app right now, it is currently 11.08 on Tuesday, May 17th. Um, it's a gorgeous 64 degrees outside currently. And when I click on the more, our humidity is at 46%. Uh, so our, our humidity is relatively low. If you were to go outside right now, it wouldn't really feel wet and gross and bleh, um, but rather very comfortable. But when our temperatures start warming up, especially come summer, um, as we learned, warmer air can hold more moisture. So the warmer it gets, the more moisture it can actually keep within it. And that's where we get those days where when you walk outside of your air conditioned vehicle or your home or whatever, and it's like you run into a wall of moisture. That's because your relative humidity's percentage is actually rather high. Um, and on the days where it's actually raining, that means that you have 100% relative humidity because the atmosphere no longer can actually just hold that water vapor. It has to go somewhere else. So in the form of precipitation, it falls to the ground and gets dispersed. Um, the tool that we use, um, typically if you're going super old school that is, um, is called a sling psychrometer. It looks just like the one that is in the picture off to the side. Um, but on one of those thermometers, you would have a piece of cloth or something that could hold a little bit of water. And you sit there and you spin it like one of those clanky things that you would get at like the circus or whatever. You would sit there and you would spin it. And after a couple of minutes, you would compare the temperature of the what is called the dry bulb or the t uh, thermometer that did not have the cloth with water. And then the wet bulb, which is the cloth with water um, thermometer, do a little bit of math, which you guys know I don't do math, um, but you do a little bit of math and it tells you, okay, there's this much humidity in the air. It could potentially hold up to this much. So we're sitting at about 46% humidity um, as it is outside. Now, we have computers that can do all of this for us now, um, but it's good to know kind of like the old school techniques that we would normally use if we were amateurs and didn't have the technology available to us. So we want to know this because the more relative humidity there is outside, the more uncomfortable it may be as far as like feeling muggy or moist or humid. Um, is the term we typically use up here, um, things like that. So that's why we look at relative humidity. Dew point. So dew point is the temperature at which the air is saturated and can't hold any more moisture. So we typically use our thermometer, um, but we also use our psychrometer because without knowing what that temperature is, we don't know how to prepare for it, sort of a thing. So once the air reaches 100% humidity or relative humidity, um, it condenses and forms precipitation, 
You'll notice first thing in the morning now, our dew points um, at night are much, much lower than during the day because it's cooler. And as we warm up into our summer, <coughs> There is more and more moisture in the air during the day, but the temperatures at night still drop to where all of that moisture has to condense and go somewhere because it just can't stay where it's at. So um, we use um, terms like uh, temperature in either Fahrenheit or Celsius as our data points, and we use our thermometer and our psychrometer in order to um, actually monitor and collect the data necessary to determine dew point. Now, I just want you to kind of watch this video, see how a barometer actually works, and then we will explain it much more in the next slide. But I feel like it's really good to know how a barometer works before we talk about it. So it's only a couple minutes, bear with me.
Okay, so <clears throat> it took a while to actually create some sort of a tool that would measure atmospheric pressure and then to have it accepted. So we finally get to air pressure, atmospheric pressure, whatever you want to call it. Um, and the tool that we use is called a barometer. And unlike the one that um, was originally created with the water or the mercury, we typically rely on a spring barometer now, um, which is like the picture shown behind. Now, that barometer shows um, measurements in millibars. So milli being like milliliter, millis millimeter, um, milligram, things like that, a very small measurement. Bar is a measurement of pressure. Um, we really only use bars when we are talking about pressure of any sort. Um, so you'll see that word come up a little bit more as we move forward. Um, so it is very small measurements of pressure. Um, we have to remember that the atmosphere is not weightless, but because of gravity and all the different particles that are within our atmosphere, it does push down on us as much as our Earth is pulling us as well toward the surface. Um, we measure atmospheric pressure because as we learned yesterday, um, with a change in pressure means that we are moving towards a change in weather. High pressure systems bring in nice, calm, clear weather. Low pressure systems bring in stormy, rainy, kind of bleh weather. So we want to keep track of this because as those move in, we're going to see a change in weather and sometimes it kind of sort of just forms. So it's good to know, oh, hey, all of a sudden now there is this high pressure system that's moving in that I need to be aware of because now it's going to be gorgeous and nice out. So if I'm going to be outside, this is when I should do it. Okay. So um, as most of you ask me on a pretty regular basis, why do we care? Why is it that I can't just tune into Hutch Johnson on Valley News Live and just he tells me what's going on for the day? You totally can and you totally should um, because that's a meteorologist's job is to know this. What you do need to understand and why I care that you know about the difference in pressure systems is because, again, the likelihood of every single one of you within my class lives in West Fargo, North Dakota the rest of your life is very, very low. Um, if any of you move out of state and especially toward, say, a coastline, you need to understand what a rise in pressure um, means for your weather. Or more importantly, you need to understand why, um, what a low pressure or um, pressure dropping means for what is going to be happening in, happening in your neck of the woods and things like that. Because I don't want you to be like my dad who lived basically his entire life within the Midwest, moved down to Florida the last two years, and one of his first seasons there, he calls me, he's like, hey, Kels, there is a low pressure system forming over the mid-Atlantic down toward the equator. What does that mean? Because everyone seems to be in a panic. Um, it means that you have a potential for a hurricane. That's what I had to explain for him. Um, so it's important to understand this because if you do move outside of here where high and low pressure systems matter, but they don't necessarily create as severe of weather as in other regions of the world, but you staying here the rest of your life might not be a thing. So we want to make sure that you are as prepared as possible. So when your meteorologist in your area starts saying, okay, we have this low pressure system forming, you know, hey, I got some weather coming. I need to make sure I'm ready for it. That sort of a thing. So that's your why should we care explanation. As you continue moving through independent work, please make sure that you are remembering your champ's expectations, a voice level zero to one, and that you get this task done. There is no exit slip, just the notes. So please be mindful of that. So what is, oh, excuse me, what is weather forecasting? 
Weather forecasting is the prediction of weather conditions over the next three-ish days. I say three-ish because weather is ever-changing and evolving to where in the next three days it could have totally changed from when we started um, forecasting it three days ago. Um, now you can, yes, because if you go into any weather app, if you listen to um, Valley News Live or whatever um, media output you listen to, they might have a five to 10 day forecast and they can start giving you rough ideas of what might be coming. But again, weather is ever evolving and changing to where you really can only go about three days out to know at least a better picture of what might be happening, but typically it's only about a day. Um, being a meteorologist and predicting the weather is like one of the few jobs where you can be wrong 80% of the time and not have any consequences. Just saying. Um, not saying that their job isn't super challenging or difficult, but eh, just something to keep in mind. Um, so the most common weather conditions that we are looking at are our relative humidity, our air pressure, our temperature, our wind speeds, and our direction. So, so let's talk about these all a little bit closer. We already talked about relative humidity and air pressure, but let's talk about the last three. And in order to do so, we do have to understand and distinguish the difference between whether it is happening um, at a surface report or an upper air report. Um, surface report obviously are taking place um, down here at Earth's surface. And we are more so concerned about this because this is where it is affecting us. So we take um, ideas of um, surface reports and things like that. So we look at temperature, air pressure, humidity, precipitation, wind speed, and direction um, because that's what is directly affecting us versus upper air reports are recorded at super high altitudes. So looking at winds, temperatures, and humidity because they're moving at a far different rate, which means that it is moving the actual fronts and air masses at a far quicker rate than what we're feeling it down on the surface. So that's why it's important to understand the two different um, reporting systems. So air temperature, this is probably the one that you look at the most often. Um, and that's because we are always constantly concerned with how are things going to feel like for us. Um, and all that. But when we're talking air temperature in here, we are talking about the ambient air temperature. So that is the temperature prior to any sort of other factors like wind or humidity, things like that. Um, as you know, we use a thermometer to identify the ambient air temperature. And we usually report this in either Celsius or Fahrenheit. You can sometimes use Kelvin, um, but typically that's left for like chemists and people who are taking like ridiculous amounts of um, temperature data collecting and things like that. So um, I also included the equations. So for our uh, data collecting, we have been just typing into the Googs like this Fahrenheit converted into Celsius, but this is how the number is actually determined. So if we took our um, Fahrenheit, divided it by 1.8, and then subtracted 32, that's where we get to our Celsius. And then if we take our 1.8, multiply it by the Celsius, and then add 32, that's how we get Fahrenheit, just converted. So if you wanted to do that math yourself, it's available to you, but I just prefer to use the Googs. So air temperature, like I said, you are more concerned with this, but yet you're not even looking at the right numbers. Typically in our region, when we're looking at numbers, we then take into consideration wind speed and direction. So wind speed, we use what's called an anemeter. Um, this is like the little cups on um, something similar to what that picture is, and it moves as fast as the wind is blowing through them. Um, we collect that data within miles per hour or kilometers per minute or kilometers per minute, however you want to say it. Um, so all that. And then we um, collect data on wind direction by using a wind sock, which is usually like those orange and white, like kite looking things at like the airport or wind vane, which is what is pictured. Um, and the arrow points or the smaller portion of the sock points in the direction in which the air is moving to. So the larger portion or the um, tail end of the arrow 
is um, the direction it has come from. So you make sure that the actual like north, south, east, west is in the correct um, direction. And then you look at that and you're like, oh, from this picture, I have a northern wind that's blowing to the south. So I know what that's going on. Now, the reason why we collect both of these pieces of data are for the same reasons, because if you think about our air masses, when we say like yesterday, we had a northern wind. So we had the wind coming out of the north and heading south. Um, and what that means is that it's bringing down dry, cool air from the poles, which feels much, much colder. Plus then if it's a faster wind temperature, it just makes it that much cooler. Versus today, same ambient temperature. It was 65 yesterday, it's 65 today. But today we have a western wind. So it's originating in the west and moving east. So it is keeping it more toward that 65 and it's um, a slower speed. So it feels much more comfortable to be outside today than it did yesterday, even though the ambient temperature was the same. So we look at this to see again, how does it make us feel? Now we collect data and we report it in ways that's easy-ish for the general public to be able to look at and understand. So we use things like satellite and radar imaging, which is also just an advancement in technology that helps us collect all this weather data so much easier. So visible satellites show where cloud formation is, which is the bottom picture. So you can see that there's clouds over, over um, to the east um, versus the infrared satellite, which shows you the amount of energy in the atmosphere. And typically where there's energy in the atmosphere, there's some sort of weather occurring, typically storms. So this helps us really forecast how storms are moving, how quickly they are moving, um, and the severity prediction of them. Um, we are concerned, like again, in the winter when we look at Seattle and we see that they are just getting dumped on with rain because as it moves across the land, it gets cooler. So it becomes snow and then that tells us relatively how much snow we're going to get or in the summer, how much rain we're going to get. Um, or if it starts to rotate, we can see those rotations. So satellite and radar are just a way to like see what's going up in the upper atmosphere, and that then turns it into what is relatively going on down at the surface level, so where it affects us. The station models are a super old school way of reporting data. So they provide all the information that we have talked about, but in just a quick little snippet. So you can see just like the circle with the flag and a couple numbers around it, that's all that would typically be sent. Um, this just has the definition of what each number means. So this typically gets sent between meteorologist to meteorologist to kind of see what's going on in different regions and how then that affects um, what may be coming in the future. So again, super old school way of reporting things, but at least they're able to be reported in a quick manner. Another sort of weather map you might be looking at include things like isobars and isotherms. So bars, again, being a measurement of pressure. Um, so isobars are these fun little bars. If you look over on the map, um, I'm going to do it in blue. You can see how there's this circle and then there's another circle and then there's the L. Um, that's because these bars are showing that there is a decrease in pressure happening towards a center eye. So to show you that that is a low pressure system moving across the um, um, moving across the upper um, eastern coast and whatnot. Um, and then isotherms would be the same sort of um, lines, but instead of measuring pressure, it's measuring temperature. So therms meaning temperature, bars meaning pressure. So this is just another way of looking at things. And this is how they truly determine where is the high pressure system versus the low pressure system. Um, so yeah. Finally, Doppler radar and computer models. Um, these are what we now rely on because this is where technology has advanced us to. Doppler radars are a special type of radar that can detect precipitation as 
um, as far up to a week um, as the movements of particles are moving and then which can then be used to approximate wind speeds and how quickly it's going to be moving and all that kind of fun jazz. This is super duper important um, for our region, especially when it comes to um, showing us where the major thunderstorms are going to be and if there's potential tornadoes that could come from it. So when we were in those tornado watches and storm warnings, it's because we were looking at our Doppler to see how it was moving from west to east. Um, computers then are able to take all of this information and put it for across the world and give us a true idea of what is going on and all that fun jazz. So it helps us figure out, okay, if there's something happening over in Seattle, we know how it might affect us here in the Midwest. Um, and vice versa for any other city to city, depending on which way your wind directions typically go and things like that. So this is to give us the whole picture. You take every piece of data and you now have created an entire picture of what our weather could and should potentially look like. Awesome, there is no exit slip today, so make sure that you get these notes completed and turned in appropriately, and I will talk to you guys soon. Thanks.